We're going to look at the book of Joshua and talk about the subject of Jesus, our captain. In the book of Joshua, the author is Joshua, and probably at the end, you got a little bit by Samuel. And this book has 24 chapters, 658 verses, and 18,858 words or somewhere around that. You got 1451 B.C. to 1427 B.C. Now, the three applications for this book. Historically, this book shows us what happens when Israel crosses Jordan and what happens when they receive the Promised Land. Doctrinally, it shows us Joshua as a picture of Jesus Christ at the Second Coming. You'll notice the battles you read about remind you of when Jesus Christ comes back for war. For example, multiple kings gather against Joshua like they will Jesus. Now, practically for us, this book shows us the warfare, spiritual warfare of the believer. The enemies defeated by Israel picture the obstacles to you having a victorious Christian life. Moses pictures the law that could only show you your sinful state. Joshua pictures Jesus Christ who takes you beyond that. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He takes you beyond what the law could ever get you. The law could never save you. The law could do nothing for you. In chapters 1 through 5, you have Israel going into the land. In chapters 6 through 12, you have the battles listed for keeping the land. In chapters 13 through 24, are primarily about the colonization of the land. And as I said, Jesus is pictured as the captain of our salvation. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's done for us. He's the only one that can save us. He's the only one that can get you through anything day to day. He's the only one. In chapter 1, Moses represents the law. Joshua represents Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ takes you further than the law. Um, Joshua took Israel much further than Moses took them. And John 1.17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now Joshua 1, 1 through 2. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan now and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. So the law shows you that you're a sinner, but it's Jesus Christ that leads you into the promised land and makes it possible for you to have a victorious Christian life. So Joshua pictures Jesus in that way. And Jesus is the captain of our salvation. In chapter 2, we have a good illustration of this right off. You got Rahab the harlot and the scarlet thread. Joshua 2, 18 and 19. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be upon our head, if any hand be upon him. So Rahab the harlot, she hid the spies, and she's told that, if she lets down this scarlet thread, then when Israel comes into Jericho to, to wipe them out, she'll be, her and her family will be spared. And that scarlet thread pictures the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation, shed his blood. And that's why me and you can be saved. That's why me and you are spared. That's why me and you are delivered from the wrath to come and saved from hell. In chapter 3, Israel crosses the Jordan on dry ground. And this is just as great of a miracle as them crossing the Red Sea. You don't hear about this one much, but Israel crosses the Jordan on dry ground. Uh, God has the waters stand up, and they got a place for their feet to stand. And the captain of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, has given you a place to stand. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. 
Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. But look at this story in Joshua three fifteen through 17. And as they that bear the ark were coming to Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap, very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zaratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain. Even the salt sea failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clear over Jordan. So Jesus Christ gives you a place to stand firm. You can stand firm on the rock. He is the, a stone of stumbling, the rock of offense. He's the rock of ages. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church, referring to himself. He's where you stand. And he gave Israel dry ground to walk on when he parted the waters of Jordan. Chapter 4, you got the memorial stones. Now these memorial stones, in Joshua 4, 4 through 7, it says, Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So it was, these stones were for a memorial. This should remind you to leave something behind for your kids to show them what Jesus did for you. And a great example of that would be a King James Bible that's marked up from the beginning to the end. Leave that behind. Uh, leave some, uh, like a prayer journal behind with all your answered prayers wrote in it. Anything spiritual that has to do with God that you could leave behind for your kids to see what God's done for you. That's your memorial stones. Now, chapter 5, you have the second generation is circumcised because they didn't get circumcised with the first generation. In Joshua 5, 2 through 5, it says, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives, and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they come forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. So this second generation isn't circumcised. And this pictures this is a picture of both circumcisions. The second one is better. The second one is when Jesus Christ gave you the spiritual circumcision. Now when you were born uh, you, you might have got physically circumcised, but at salvation, you got the spiritual circumcision. Colossians 2.11, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's the circumcision you want. When you got saved, the Lord cut your soul loose from your flesh, for this reason, you can't lose your salvation, your sins, and the flesh. Never touch the soul again. So, that's the spiritual circumcision. And that's what this picture is here in chapter 5. Uh, Joshua has to go back and circumcise. Get, make sure this second generation is circumcised. And it pictures the, our, the first and second circumcisions. Then in this same chapter, you also have Jesus Christ showing up, a pre-appearance of Jesus Christ as the angel of the Lord, the captain of the Lord's hosts. 
In Joshua 5, 13 through 15, it says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Notice that Joshua worshipped him. That's a good sign that, obviously, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua's worshiping him. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. And remember, that's what the angel of the Lord said to Moses back there when he appeared to him in the burning bush. The place where thou standest is holy ground. You remember he said that to Moses. So this is a pre-appearance of Jesus here. And, you know, Joshua just walks up to him and is like, man, are you for us or for our adversaries? This shows you how brave and tough and confident in the Lord Joshua was to approach the angel of the Lord when he didn't even know who he was. Chapter 6, you got the battle of Jericho and Rahab is spared. You know, Rahab, she let down that scarlet thread and she's spared. Chapter 7. This is a crazy chapter where Israel is smitten by Ai because of the sins of Achan. And you see, the Lord revealed to Joshua that sin was going on in the camp. And this pictures to me how Jesus reveals our sins to us and brings them to our attention. And you see, you got to get rid of the sin to get victory, to have the victorious Christian life. So Israel is defeated by Ai because of sin in the camp. There are consequences for sin. Sin always hinders the victorious Christian life. And Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation, he lives in us. He's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he will let you know when you're sinning. He'll bother you. But I want to show you this in Joshua seven nineteen through 21. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold and fifty shekels weight. Then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So here's the order. This shows you the process of sin. You see something. He saw the goodly Babylonian garment. He saw something he wasn't supposed to have. Then he coveted it, coveted it, and then he took it. You see something you want that you ain't supposed to have. You think, well, should I take it or should I not take it? Should I go after it? Should I not go after it? You're coveting it, and then you take it. And then some people hide it. He took it and hid it in the earth in the midst of his tent. Then you, that, That's a picture of your hidden sin. But you know what happens with Achan? They had to kill him, kill him and his family. And... They had to get rid of sin to get the victory. This picture is in your life. If you want the victorious Christian life, you're going to have to nip the sin in the in the butt. And if you do that, you're going to get victory because in chapter 8, AI is conquered. They conquer AI. And it's an awesome story about how they they come in there and they use the art of deception to conquer AI. Israel uses the art of deception some of Israel pretends to run away as if they've been beat. And then the men of Ai pursue them and run after them. But then Ai is ambushed from behind and is, uh, uh, more soldiers from Israel burn down the city. In Joshua eight fifteen through 21, it says, And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. And all the people that were in Ai were called together to pursue after them, and they pursued after Joshua and were drawn away from the city. And there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel that went not out after Israel. So they all left, and they left the city open and pursued after Israel. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in thy hand toward Ai, for I will give it into thine hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city, and the ambush arose quickly out of their place, and they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered into the city and took it, 
and hasted and set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people that fled to the wilderness turned back upon the pursuers. So the people that were running away, who were acted like they had, were beat, uh, turned around and came back at Ai because they had nowhere to go. Their city was on fire. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, then they turned again and slew the men of Ai. So you have the art of deception used for war. And then chapter 9, you got the Gibeonites, they trick Israel. Uh, the Gibeonites are afraid of Israel because of all their victories, and they are actually very close by, but actually pretend to be from a far country, and they make a league with Israel, even though the Lord didn't want them to make any treaties with anybody else. You see, uh, Jesus, just like this picture is how Jesus Christ is the captain of our salvation. We don't need to make a league with the world to win the world. You see, a lot of Christians, they, they got Jesus Christ living in them. They got the power of God, but they're going to the world to, to get more weaponry to use in spiritual warfare. They're going and getting the modern versions of the Bible. They're getting uh, all types of worldly activities in their church, the worldly music, making a league with the world to win the world. You know, you don't want to make a league with the world. Israel wasn't supposed to make a league with anybody else. But the Gibeonites tricked them into it. Then in chapter 10, you got the crazy story about how God makes the sun stand still and rains hailstones down on the five kings of the Amorites and their armies, and more people was killed by the hell stones than by Israel themselves. And God's just beating all these nations up, and it's Israel may may be looking good, but it's all God. It's all Jesus Christ. Just like any, anything that you do good, it was the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of your salvation, that did in, anything you do good, all credit goes to Jesus Christ. Anything you do bad, all credit goes to you. Because you are you are a screw-up in your flesh. You are a sinner in your flesh. All glory goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. But God makes the sun stand still there until those those five the five kings, uh, the, those five nations are, are just demolished. And it says in Joshua 10, 5, Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. So this pictures the nations coming together against Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation. Because in Revelation sixteen sixteen you have a prophecy of what happens at the second coming. The nations gather together against Jesus Christ. And that's why I said doctrinally this book pictures the battles, the battle of the second coming. In Revelation sixteen sixteen, And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now chapter 11, the Lord, it says the Lord puts it in the heart of the nations to fight Israel. It says in Joshua eleven nineteen through 20, There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. All other they took in battle, for it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, that they should not come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. So God's the one that puts it in their heart together, together against Israel. Just like in the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, uh, it's his determination to gather them nations together so he can just kill them faster. In Zephaniah 3.8 it says, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So God puts it on their heart to gather together against him. Now, uh, Jesus Christ doesn't want you to gather together with anybody except other Bible believers, other Christians. All this stuff of getting together with the Catholics and the Pentecostals and the Church of Christ, 
and people with a false gospel, yeah, that's that's wrong. You don't want to gather together with anybody that does not believe the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 12, you got the list of conquered kings. And this is, I mean, it's can be kind of hard to read, but it's interesting. The list of people that Joshua and Israel conquered. And this should remind you of the victories God has given you. If you don't remember some victories God's given you, you need to write them down so you don't forget them. Make a list of things God has helped you conquer. All the victories. First thing, you got victory over death if you can't think one. Uh, Jesus Christ had victory over death, hell, and the grave, and he's given you victory over death, hell, and the grave. He's the captain of your salvation, and He led you. he's going to lead you through the, all of this. Um, he already went through death. He paved the way for you to make it through death. I mean, if death was uh, a sea, he he uh, parted the waters and, and he's having you walk through on dry ground to the other side. In chapter 13, you got land that's still to be possessed. There's So this pictures how there's always more work to be done, more people to save, more room to improve. You You never sit down. Uh, Jesus Christ, he's the captain of your salvation. He wants you to maintain good works. He's given you your marching orders. He wants you to keep going. Press toward the mark for the prize of the high, high calling. He, he wants you to keep going. Uh, 14 through 19, these chapters detail who gets which parts of the land that Israel has gone into possess. It also shows that the Lord wants to give his people an inheritance. You see... Um, Israel's going to get the land, but you you also get a part in the land. If you're faithful here, Paul says, you know, if we, if, if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. God's going to give us some, uh, some parts. We're going to reign as well. And Colossians 3.24, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ, the captain of your salvation, wants to reign with you. Chapter 14, you got Caleb's inheritance. Chapter 15, you got the allotment for Judah. 16 through 17, allotment for Ephraim and Manasseh. Chapter 18, allotment of remaining land. Chapter 19, inheritance of the tribes. Chapter 20, you got the cities of refuge. So they made cities of refuge for a man to flee. For a man to flee to if he kills somebody by accident. If the man gets to the city of refuge, then the slayer can't kill him. In Joshua 20 and verse 5, it says, And if the avenger of blood pursue after him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up into his hand, because he smote his neighbor unwittingly and hated him not before time. So Jesus Christ is our city of refuge. And if you don't get to Jesus Christ before it is too late, then you meet him as the avenger of blood, instead of as the bloody Savior. So Jesus Christ, the city of refuge pictures Jesus Christ. He's who you run to to get away from the avenger of blood. You can see at the second coming, Jesus Christ is coming back as the avenger of blood. But right now, he's offering himself to you as the bloody Savior. He wants to be the captain of your salvation. You can join the Lord's army. Chapter 21, you got cities for Levites. Chapter 22, you got the eastern tribes build an altar. And then in chapter 23 and 24, you got the end of Joshua's life. Jesus Christ will help you finish your course. Joshua finished his course. In chapter 23, Joshua's charge to Israel's leaders. Chapter 24, you got Joshua's farewell message and the famous... The very famous verse, Joshua twenty four fifteen. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So you need to choose sides. Are you going to choose the devil, or are you going to choose Jesus Christ, the captain of your salvation?